I always love those Christmas songs that not only talk about the birth of Christ, but the second coming of Christ and the establishment of the kingdom, as we've just heard, because so many of the prophecies that we read about in the Old Testament foretelling the coming of Christ connect not just his birth, but also his coming again in power. I love the book of Acts, as we've been studying through now for quite some time, because it shows the things that you and I take for granted and what we understand about God and the Bible, but they were still figuring a lot of this out. They were still trying to figure out um, what it was that God wanted them to do now that he had done this great work in bringing his son as Messiah and revealing the mystery of the church. And what we find is that you and I will never do what it is we're called to do until we first are what we are called to be. There's a definite connection in being before doing, if we're going to have the impact. And I, and I remember there was a time when I was what you might call an undercover Christian. I was saved when I was 18 years old and went off to college shortly afterwards. And, and when I was there, I tried to keep it quiet that I had become a Christian. If I went to church, I didn't make a big deal about it in front of my friends or even in front of my family. And so I was quiet about it. I was saved, but people just didn't know. I kept it quiet, and during that time, I spoke and I acted and I lived just like a lot of my friends that didn't know the Lord did. And I realized I was having no impact on them for good whatsoever. And I'd go and I'd sit in church and I'd hear people talk about how uh, Jesus said we're to be the salt in the earth and we're supposed to be light in this dark world, and I was none of those things. And the only way that I became any of those things was to let people know who I was and what God had done in my life and I had to start living a godly life and becoming that kind of Christian before I could have the impact on others. And many people have little impact for Christ in the lives of those around them, people that they love oftentimes or, or are in cordial friendships with. Uh, and these people are saved, and perhaps they're in church like I was, and maybe they even have a desire to be used by God, but they seem like there's little fruit, there's little impact from their life into the lives of others. What might be something that is holding them back? Is there something that we can focus on, that we can look at, that would allow you and I to have a greater impact, a greater influence on our family members, greater influence on our friends, on our coworkers, our classmates, on those that we encounter in our neighborhood? Well, we're gonna look at what God is doing in the early church, in the Gentile world, and we're going we're gonna to see a, a little, a little, just a little passage here, but it opens up an, a, um, a secret, if you will, an open secret on how to be greater, uh, use greater of the Lord. So we're in Acts chapter 11, beginning in verse number 1, and we're going to skip a section for time's sake and come back to it later. It says in Acts, number, Acts chapter 11, in verse number 1, And the apostles and brethren that were in Judea heard the Gentiles, heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. And when Peter was come up to Jerusalem, they that were of the circumcision contended with him, saying, Thou wentest into men uncircumcised, and didst eat with them. But Peter rehearsed the matter from the beginning, and expounded it by order unto them, saying. And we're going to skip over to the end of Peter's explanation here to verse 15. And as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them, as on us at the beginning. Then remembered I the word of the Lord, how, he, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. For as much then as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us, who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I could withstand God? When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen, traveled as far as Phenis and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. And some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which, when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed, and turned unto the Lord. Then tidings of these things came into the ears of the church that was in, that was in Jerusalem, and they sent forth Barnabas, that he should go as far as Antioch, who, when he came, had seen the grace of God, was glad, and exhorted them all, that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. For he was a good man, and full of the Holy Ghost, and of faith, and much people was added unto the Lord. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus, for to seek Saul. 
And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch, and it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people, and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and for the power of it. I pray that you would send it forth tonight to accomplish whatever it is that you desire to see done in our hearts. I pray that you give us ears to hear, give me fitly spoken words and clarity of thought and speech, and that your word might go forth in Jesus' name. Amen. What we're seeing in this passage is Peter had been traveling and, and preaching and doing miracles and going around the area around Judea, and when he was speaking with all of the different Jewish people, a Gentile man named Cornelius was told by an angel that he needed to send for Peter and to do whatever it is that Peter told him he needed to do, which was an unusual request because, if you'll remember, the Jewish people and the Gentile people, and Gentile is a term that means anybody that really wasn't Jewish, they did not get along. They didn't do business together. They didn't have friendships together. They didn't even live near each other. They wouldn't have been brought into each other's uh, homes. That was just off limits. It was culturally taboo. You would be ritually unpure if you were around a Gentile and their foods and things like that. And so the Jewish people just didn't have a lot to do with them. So here is a Gentile man who sent his Gentile servant to go and ask for a Jewish man to come and to tell them what God had been doing with Jesus as Messiah. And Peter is told in a vision, and Peter goes. And the Lord says, you need to go. And then he preached the gospel to Cornelius and all these people that he gathered together. And then Cornelius and his, his family, they believed. And they, they were saved. And Peter stayed there and taught them some days. And, and so now we're on the, the other end of that. We're on the other side of it. And so a little bit of our passage is sort of winding up the time with Peter. And then something that happened connected, but we look at Barnabas and then eventually Saul again. So in, Gen in, in uh, chapter 11, it says, And the apostles and brethren that were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. Jesus Christ was a Jewish Messiah prophesied by Jewish scriptures to come and to save God's people first, but wasn't just for God's people. Even when Jesus Christ, as a babe, was found in the temple on the eighth day, having his ritual circumcision done, there was a man who realized who he was, and he said that you will be a light to lighten the Gentiles. So not only was Jesus the Messiah for the Jews, but he was also salvation for the Gentiles, which most of us are Gentiles in this room, and we should be very thankful that the Jewish Messiah did not just come to save the Jewish people, but every person of any ethnicity or any background. And so they heard that this was going on, and now we see this time as the church, where you have Jews and Gentiles together in one fold, and we just assume that that's how it's always been. But that is not how it's always been. There were Gentiles that would oftentimes come and become God-fearers, so they didn't convert to Judaism, but they believed in the God of the Bible, or some of them would go so far as to become a proselyte and go through all the rituals to become as Jewish as a Gentile could be. Uh, they could never become truly a Jewish person, but they could follow certain steps. And that was a rarity that these things happened. And so now, Old Testament to New Testament, there is a great break, a great difference. And the apostles and brethren that were still in the land of the Jews, they'd heard that the Gentiles, the gospel had been given to them, and they'd received the word of God. Now, you'd think, yay, that's awesome. The Gentiles are getting saved too. Not so much. That was not the initial reaction of the Jewish believing people. In verse number two, it says, And Peter was come up to Jerusalem, and they that were of the circumcision contended with him. So Peter leaves Caesarea, where he happened to be with Cornelius and everyone, and he heads back up to Jerusalem, and as he comes to Jerusalem, he starts getting criticized. He starts getting condemned for the fact that he went in to their homes, these Gentile people, and that he actually ate with them. Verse 3 says it, saying, thou wentest in to men uncircumcised and did eat with them. A reminder that circumcision is that token in the flesh where somebody is entering into the covenant, that promise that God made to Abraham and to his lineage, that you are God's people and that he is your God and that you are following after him. And so when it says here that the circumcision contended with him, they're saying the Jewish believers, the believers in Jesus that happened to be Jewish, the vast majority of them were at the beginning, that they were criticizing him because he interacted with these Gentile people in a way that they did not like. Verse number four, but Peter rehearsed the matter from the beginning and expounded it by order unto them, saying. 
So what does Peter do when he's criticized? What we see here is he doesn't start yelling at them. He doesn't start arguing with them. He doesn't start calling out about how they're not spreading Jesus' message or about how Jesus gave him this charge to help be a leader in the early church or how he's done miracles and even brought dead people back to life. He doesn't get into some sort of mudslinging with his critics. Instead, what he does is he restates, he explains again. And that is great advice when you're being criticized. Instead of getting into it with somebody, simply restate your position, be as scriptural as you can, and allow it to speak for itself. And we're going to just briefly go through what it is that happened, because we've spent a couple of sermons on it. If you'd like to know more about Peter and Cornelius and what happened, I recommend you listen to the two previous sermons that we had on the book of Acts. It goes into it in detail. Verse 5. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. And a certain vessel descended, and it had been a great sheet, let down from heaven by four corners, and it came even to me. Upon the which, when I had fastened mine eyes, I considered, and saw four-footed beasts of the earth, and wild beasts, and creeping things, and fowls of the air. And I heard a voice saying unto me, Arise, Peter, slay, and eat. But I said, Not so, Lord, for nothing common or unclean hath at any time entered into my mouth. But the voice answered me again from heaven, What God hath cleansed, that call not thou uncommon, or that call not thou common. And this was done three times, and all were drawn up again into heaven. And behold, immediately there were three men, already come to the house where I was, sent from Caesarea unto me. And the Spirit bade me to go with them, nothing doubting. Moreover, these six brethren accompanied me, and we entered into the man's house, and he showed us how he had seen an angel in his house, which stood, and said unto him, Send men to Joppa, and call for Simon, whose surname is Peter, who shall tell thee words, whereby thou and all thy house shall be saved. And as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them, as on us at the beginning. So the recap is, Peter has a vision. God is trying to teach him that when God has cleansed something, it doesn't matter what he thinks he understands from before. What God has cleansed, don't call that common or unclean. When God does a changing work, a saving work in somebody's life, regardless of where they came from, once God has entered into it, they are clean. And so this wasn't just about eating things and not eating the wrong things. If you remember, there were certain rules on what the Jewish people could and could not eat and what they could eat and mixed with what and with whom they could eat. And so that was being used in a way to tell Peter, listen, if I've offered these things to you, then you should feel free in order to take them. And he says, I've offered these people to you. They want to hear the gospel. You should go and take advantage of the opportunity in order to preach the gospel to them. He does, they hear, they get saved, and at the end of him explaining the gospel, the signs of the Spirit of God, when it came on the apostles in Pentecost, in some way manifested also on these Gentile believers, which is not something that anybody expected. In the Old Testament, the only time that the Spirit came on somebody was when they were chosen for a special service to God. They were like the heroes of the Old Testament. When the Spirit came on somebody, it was for a certain task or a certain role that they were in, and when the time was done, the Spirit could leave. If they messed up too badly, the Spirit could leave. We, as New Testament believers, have this promise that the moment we trust Christ as Savior, the Spirit comes to dwell with us and will never leave us. It wasn't like that in the Old Testament. And it was amazing to the Jewish people that they thought the Spirit of God has come to live in every Jewish believer now, that gets saved, and then when they see the Gentiles also having the Spirit of God, it's very unexpected, very uncomfortable in some ways. Because through much of history, the Jewish people, especially recent history to what we're reading, looked at Gentiles as the oppressor. First it was the, the um, Assyrians, and then it was the Babylonians, and then it was the Medes and Persians, and then it was the Greeks, and, and then it was the Romans, and the, the Jewish people, which should have been free, and to stand on their own as God's chosen people and their kingdom kept getting conquered by foreign lands because they refused to yield themselves to God. Then they would sin and God would take his hand of, per, of uh, protection off of them. And so there was this strong, uh, fierce animosity between the Jewish people and the Gentile people. And to see their God so willingly accepting Gentiles, not begrudgingly well, like, oh, well, I guess we can let you into our secret club but giving them all the benefits that he gave them was eye-opening and caused contention. Peter says in verse 16, Then remembered I the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water, 
but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. Baptism is immersion, right? It's being dunked. It's being completely put under the water. And in the same way that John the Baptist baptized Jesus and others in the River Jordan when they would be fully put into the water and then brought back out of the water, we believe that that's what the Bible teaches about baptism rather than sprinkling, which is something that came on later on. We believe baptism is by immersion. And they're saying in the same way that you go completely into the water, Jesus promised that you would be completely entered into the Spirit of God, the Holy Ghost. You would be baptized with the Holy Spirit. You would be immersed in it. And he says that promise was made to us, and now they've got it too. Verse 17, For as much then as God gave them the like gift as he did unto us who believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, what was I that I could withstand God? He's talking to his critics, and he says, this is what God did. Jesus said this would happen to us. It also happened to them. He's obviously, God is obviously choosing these Gentiles. What, who am I to withstand God? If this is what God wants to do, then I'm going to go with it. You're always on good ground, by the way, if you're on God's side. You're never going to find yourself in the wrong place if you're doing what it is the Lord has asked you to do. And so though Peter knew that some folks would not like what he did and they would criticize him for what he did, he did it anyway because he saw that's where the Lord had led him. And when he explained all these things, it says in verse 18, when they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. So the folks that were before upset heard what the Lord did, heard how Peter explained it, and said, well, if that's what happened, then God's done something that we didn't expect. It said God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. When you turn from your sins and you turn to the Lord, believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, you have the forgiveness of sins. You have eternal life. And God has opened the door for the Gentiles to do that as well. And so much of what we're reading about in the next few chapters is God working through spreading the gospel among the Gentile people. So we're going to jump into the, the meat of it now in verse 19. Now they which were scattered abroad by the, upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Phenis and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. The Lord Jesus Christ gave the early church marching orders to go into all the world and to preach the gospel to every creature. But for the first few years after the church started and Jesus ascended back up into heaven, they all kind of hung out around Jerusalem. They didn't want to go out. They liked what they had. They, for a while, were even allowed to worship at, in Solomon's porch in the temple, and they would meet there, and they would gather and preach and teach, and God was doing miracles, and many mighty things were happening, until the non-believing Jewish leadership of the temple said, you guys have to stop. And so eventually people were arrested, and people were beaten, and people were threatened, and it got to the point where one of the first deacons, Stephen, was actually martyred. He was killed as he stood as a witness for Jesus Christ. And persecution was getting worse and worse, and people were being treated worse and worse if they were followers of Jesus, to the point where the unbelieving Jewish leadership ran them out of Jerusalem and out of the, many of the cities in Judea so that they had to leave and head off towards more Gentile areas if they were going to find safety. And so when it says that this persecution, it forced people to leave and to spread out. Verse 20. And some of them, well, a quick note by the end of verse 19, it says, preaching the word to none but unto the Jews only. So as these Christian believers spread out to the different cities, they took with them the message of Jesus Christ. And they told, anytime they found a Jewish person in one of these Gentile cities, or they found a synagogue in one of these Gentile cities, they all got together and they said, hey, we found the Messiah. Let me tell you who the Messiah is, because we know the promises of the Messiah. And so they shared the good news, and so things spread. But in verse 20, it says, And some of them, which were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which, when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. So you've got these other men that weren't perhaps as strictly Jewish-minded because of where they grew up and where they were from. They decided that they were going to tell the Greeks. They were going to start finding Greek people and telling them about the Messiah. And see what happened. Verse 21, The hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed and turned unto the Lord. You never know who it is that's going to be ready to receive Christ when you tell them. I know there are people that you think about in your own life, or maybe people that you see, 
that perhaps the Spirit of God prompts you in the grocery store or sitting in a doctor's office or, or even a neighbor down the street, and you think, that person, just look at them. They're rough. They are rough. I, I, don't even, I don't think they want to hear anything about God. You know, you look at them and you think, if I were to talk to them, they might be furious with me. Maybe it would even turn into some sort of fight or some yelling match. I just, I don't think they're interested. A lot of people would have said, there's no way that these Greeks are going to hear about a Jewish Messiah and believe him. The Greeks already have religion. They have many religions. They have lots of gods with a little g. You probably studied the Greek and Roman gods uh, in, in school at one point when you studied ancient history, and they have Zeus and and they have Hera and all of these others. They, they've got their religion, so why would we bother telling them? But these folks from Cyprus and Cyrene decide, we're going to start telling everybody and see who will believe, because this Jesus really is the Messiah. And not just a few of them, but many of them believe. And it's the fact that the Lord was with them, that these boundaries that they thought were there were crossed. I don't think it was that they were particularly eloquent, or that they understood all the ins and outs of the Greek religion. Some of them probably knew more than others. But God decided to bless, and a great number of people turned to the Lord from their old gods, from their old sin, from their old religion, and believed on him. Now, this creates a little more problems, because now it's not just Cornelius, one guy with his family and his friends around him that gets saved, but now you have a number of Greek people getting saved. Verse 22, then tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church, which was in Jerusalem. So they hear it's, it's spreading. It's not just one guy who's a, a God-fearer. Now all of these Greeks are getting saved. A ton of them have started to believe in the true and living God, and more specifically, that Jesus Christ is their Messiah. What are we going to do? They decide that they need an investigator. And so they sent forth Barnabas, that he should go as far as Antioch. We've met Barnabas before. If you've been with us through the book of Acts, you've encountered Barnabas. He was a person who was full of the Holy Ghost. He was someone who was willing to take second and third chances on people. He was very compassionate. He had uh, property, and he sold it and gave all of the money to help meet the needs of the people that were in the church and so that God's work might go forward. He was the best kind of man, a man of character and integrity. And so when the time came to send someone to figure out what's going on here in Antioch, who are these people that now are talking about getting saved and that know Jesus but are not Jewish, they send him to Antioch, which, by the way, was a Gentile city. There were Jewish people there as well, but it was multicultural. And what you would end up having is Jews and Gentiles in one church together. See if that doesn't fix that. Verse 23. Who, when he came and had seen the grace of God, was glad and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. You know what Barnabas did when he showed up? He started looking at the lives of these people that supposedly had become believers, and he was glad because he saw God's grace in their lives. He saw them transformed from their old ways, from their old sinful practices, from offering things to idols, from engaging in activities that are obviously sinful, but were part of their worship. They're no longer doing that. And now they've turned to the true and living God, and they're actually meeting and fellowshipping with other believers in Jesus Christ. He was thrilled to see this happen. He had the kind of heart where instead of trying to keep people out and find reasons why we're different from them and we don't like them and they're not like us, we need to try and keep people out, he was thrilled that it happened. And so he took on the role of a teacher and an encourager, and he exhorted them, right? He said, here's what you need to do. You need to purpose in your heart to, to stay with God, to cleave to the Lord. Don't let this be some passing thing that you found. It was known as we'll see later on, certain groups of the Greeks, especially in Athens, they just loved to talk religion and philosophy. They loved to argue about it. Do any of you have a friend or a family member that just loves to get into all sorts of discussions about stuff at family get-togethers? Maybe it's politics, maybe it's religion, maybe it's just sports, and they're on the wrong side of things, but they love to stir up, and they just want to talk, and they just want to fight. Right? There was a number of people that would do that, and there was even a place in the city in Athens where they did it all the time, and they were just always, someone would give a talk, and then everyone would tear apart their talk and criticize it, and 
different philosophies were flying around. And Barnabas did not want these people to say, oh, I believe in, in, in this Jesus, and then to leave him. And then to walk away, to go back to what they were. Because they're going to face some hardships. They're going to face some hardships from leaving their former life and their former way of being and becoming a Christian. I don't know if any of you have a background where you were devoutly of another religion before you came to Christ. But if you found yourself coming to Christ, you may have experienced, even if you were of a, a so-called different denomination, and you left that in order to become a Bible-believing Christian and attend a, a Bible-believing church, you may have gotten a hard time from your family. They may have been unhappy that you did that. I was, I was saved at 18 years old, and really my church experience till then, up until then, was in a Greek Orthodox church, right? If you don't know what a Greek Orthodox church is, imagine a Catholic church, which most of you have probably been in, but instead of things being in Latin from time to time, they're in Greek from time to time. You have lots of icons and statues, you have lots of incense being burned, lots of ritual expression, lots of gold and ivory, and stand up, sit down, say this thing at a certain time, what they call liturgical, right? A very high church liturgical type environment. And I really didn't know what was going on or why we did anything that was a part of that. I didn't really believe it for myself. I didn't have a strong church background in that, but I had relatives that were. And when I became a Baptist, I heard things like a Greek Baptist. Who ever heard of a Greek Baptist? Well, I happen to believe we're reading about Greek Baptists right now because I believe that Baptist people are synonymous with New Testament believers. If I thought that in America there was a group of people doing it more closely to the New Testament than Baptist, I'd go be one of them. But I haven't found that that's to be the case. And I'm not proud to be a Baptist, but I am thankful for my Baptist heritage. And so what we find is, like I experienced some from some of my family, though all of that has gone by the wayside now for most of them, um, they would probably face that and the troubles that went along with it. So Barnabas encouraged them to stick with the stuff, that they would cleave unto the Lord. Verse 24, for he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith, and much people was added unto the Lord. Barnabas was down there in Antioch, and he was in and among these people. And as he was in and among these new believers, his character shined through. He was a good man. And we've read other things about Barnabas, too. And because he was a good man and he was full of the Holy Ghost and of faith, which meant, how, how are you full of the Holy Ghost? Well, you get all of the Holy Ghost that you're going to get the moment that you're saved. When you come to believe on Christ, you have all of the Spirit dwelling within you. The question is how much we yield to him. It's been said like this. You have all, the, all of the Holy Spirit you're ever going to get, but how much of you does the Holy Spirit have? Right? How much have you given over? Have you yielded? Have you said, Lord, I'm going to let you make that decision in that area of my life? You now control what I am and am not going to do on my Friday nights, what I am and am not going to watch, what I am and am not going to listen to, what I am and am not going to spend my money on or, or my time on or the kind of people that I'm going to associate myself with. I'm going to yield all of this to you, Lord, and say, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, and surrender and yield to God. That's how you become full of the Holy Ghost, and the Holy Ghost is calling the shots in all these different areas of your life. And Barnabas was someone who had reached a place in his life where he was full of it, this Holy Ghost decision-making, this Holy Ghost motivation. God had every part of him. He was yielding, and he was full of faith. He believed that God was able. He believed that God was able to save even these Gentiles to the uttermost. And because of his character and because of who he was, much people were added unto the Lord. It doesn't talk about the sermons he preached. It doesn't talk about his organizational skills. It doesn't talk about what kind of great music they had in the church there or what kind of um, programs they had for the children of these Gentiles. What it was, it was his character. His character and being what he should be led him to do what he needed to do. And just by virtue of him being the right kind of person, the natural actions flowed out, and much people were added to the Lord because of it. Well, he knows that this is not just a work for him. He sees so much opportunity that he leaves to go find someone else. Verse 25. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. And when he had found him, verse 26, he brought him to Antioch, and it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. 
he sees the great opportunity. He sees these people truly believing. He says, you know who would love this? Is Saul of Tarsus, who we know as the Apostle Paul. If you remember, everywhere Saul went after he got saved, he would preach the gospel and get run off. And eventually, he had to flee for his life and to leave Jerusalem and to head back to his hometown where he grew up before he went to learn at Jerusalem. He lived in Tarsus, and he was there ministering for a number of years before Barnabas went, found him, grabbed him, took him with him to Antioch, and for a year, they sat there and taught. And it talks about now there is a church there. And they taught much people. Much was accomplished. So much so that the first time we ever heard the word Christian used was of these multicultural Gentile Jewish congregation members in Antioch. They're the ones who were called Christians or someone who's like Christ, who is a follower of Christ. In fact, the term was not, was not a flattering term. It was not a flattering term. It was used, most likely, as a negative thing. Oh, you're just a bunch of, one of those Christ people, right? One of those Jesus freaks. You're one of those fanatics. You're, you're following after that Messiah. Oh, you're one of them. And eventually, it became a badge of honor to where it's like, yes, I want to be known as someone who's like Jesus. That's not a bad thing to us at all, even though it was perhaps used like that at the beginning. So before we go on and look at anything else, let's draw some applications tonight. Let's draw some applications tonight. First of all, when criticized, don't respond, restate. Don't respond, restate. Peter was criticized for his behavior, but he was following the Lord. And instead of fighting back, and instead of taking his pedigree against somebody else's pedigree, instead of saying, I've done more for God than you've done, and I know more, I was actually with Jesus, and you weren't with Jesus, instead of him getting into some sort of, uh, of match, and fighting against someone, he said, this is what happened. This is what happened. Let me tell you again, because it said tidings had already gotten back, but he said, let me just restate, and let me tell you exactly what happened. And so he restated it, and his critics were silenced, and people ended up coming around. They glorified God. They were, they were excited. They said, well, God's done it for the Gentiles too, just like us. It's tempting to answer your critics. It's tempting to, whether it's online, and I know that if you put anything on your Instagram or Facebook that's about the Lord, at some point someone has said something, haven't they? Right? They've been a little bit like, oh man, there you go again. Or maybe they've said something like, I can't believe you've done that. Like if, if you were really not a Christian in your adult life before you became a believer and then you became a believer and you start putting stuff about Jesus up there, they're like, what happened to you? And they'll, they'll put little digs in there, especially if you're putting up uh, Christian ideas or biblical ideas surrounding hot-button issues, whether it's about abortion or about the LGBTQ movement or, or all of these different... Um, if you put something up there, you're going to get critics. And it's tempting to, to want to blast them. But that's your flesh. That's my flesh. Our flesh wants to just strike back at anybody who strikes at us. It's supernatural to return with grace. But what I've found is that you arguing with somebody or me arguing with somebody rarely brings about what we hope for. What is it we hope for? We want people to know Jesus. And arguing with people, especially online, is just not very fruitful. But restating truth again and again and again is the thing that wins people to faith in Christ. Truth is powerful. God's word is powerful. And it will not return void, meaning it doesn't fail, it doesn't return empty. It's accomplishing things in people's lives. I remember before I became a Christian, I, I was an atheist. I did not believe in God, and I didn't want anything to do with God, and I thought I had good reasons to not believe in God, but I really didn't. If anyone had argued with me, they would have found out pretty quickly that I was just repeating stuff that I'd heard, which is the vast majority of people that you run into that say that they're atheists. Most of, most of them are not watching debates and Richard Dawkins and John Lennox and other people. They're not, they're not doing that kind of stuff or Hitchens. They're, they're not doing that. They've just heard stuff out there. Um, but even those folks, you might win an argument with them, but you will lose the person. And so it has to be us being the kind of people that we ought to be, praying for them, showing them the love of Christ, and sharing the truth over and over again. 
No one argued me into faith in Christ. They just faithfully kept giving me the gospel. And by God's grace, I came to be saved. Remember, no one comes out clean in a mudslinging match. Nobody comes out, out clean. Um, and, and, you know, don't, don't, you know, what do they say? Don't get into a mudslinging match with a pig. Because everyone comes out dirty and the pig actually likes us. Right? So it's, it's just not a good use of our time. Handle it with grace. Handle it with clarity. And you might find that God uses his troops to not just silence your critics, but to draw them to truth, to draw them to himself and to bring him glory. So when you're criticized, don't respond in like manner. Instead, restate the truth. Second of all, share the gospel. You never know who's ready to hear it. You never know who's ready to receive it. These believing refugees fled, sharing the good news with Jewish people. However, one of the groups went out of their way to speak with the Greeks, these Gentiles. And so you might say, what are the chances that these people who've never known who Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were, who didn't ever learn the law, who have no idea about the creator God of the universe, who, who are, I mean, what are the chances that they're actually going to believe if you share the gospel with them? Well, they did. They did. And you and I don't know what it is that God has already done in someone's life. By the time that I came to faith in Christ, at that, at that moment when I remember finally yielding to God drawing me and me deciding to believe on the Lord Jesus, God had gotten all in my business. He'd gotten all in my business. And he started taking away some things, and he started pointing out some things. And, and for 18 months, I listened to the good news, attending church on and off, and I refused to hear it until God started turning up the volume as he was speaking to me. And situations started to become uncomfortable, and he really got my attention, but I was stubborn, and I didn't want to listen. And so by the time I believed on the Lord, if somebody didn't know anything about what God had been doing in my life, they'd be like, oh, wow, well, he finally got saved. That's great. But a lot went into it before anybody ever saw the fruit. And you and I might look at somebody. Maybe we think we know what's going on in someone's life. But do we ever really know everything that's going on in someone's life? We don't. I mean, even just the people that are here in this room or those that are watching us online tonight, we couldn't possibly know everything that's going on in someone's heart and mind. And so we might think they'll never believe, but when you bring it up to them, they, it's, not, it's not uncommon to, hear, uncommon to hear, you know, I've been thinking about that. That's weird that you bring it up. It's weird that that happened because something a couple weeks ago or a month ago this happened and someone said this or, you know, my aunt, my grandmother, somebody's been telling me the same thing for years and it's just strange that you would bring it up to me again. You never know how these things kind of play together and what God is doing behind the scenes. So instead of thinking not them or they won't listen or it'd take a miracle, trust that God is working in people's lives. I was always very intimidated when I was told that I should share the gospel with people because I felt like it was on me to take them from zero and get them to 100%. I had to, I had to start and I had to know so much about the Bible and I had to have everything in, in, in my mind fixed in all my Bible verses and I had to just know all of it perfectly and I had to take them when they were unwilling to go from here to here. And that's what I viewed soul winning or witnessing as. You know what I found out? Instead of it being some impossible sales pitch that I have to give, I found that it's more like treasure hunting. It's more like treasure hunting because you're, you're not trying to make something happen. That's the job of the Holy Spirit. You are giving out the gospel. You are spreading the good news, waiting to see who God has prepared and who's ready to receive it. It's not, it's not really up to us. We are witnesses. It's the Holy Spirit that argues the case. If you want to think about it in terms of a courtroom, you've got your, your attorneys that are actually arguing for or against something, then you've got your witnesses that are simply saying what happened, and it's the attorney's job to take what the witnesses say and to use that to sway the jury or to sway the judge. In the same way, when it comes to sharing the gospel, we just witness, we just tell what God did for us. We, we tell what the, it says in God's word that Jesus Christ did for every man, woman, boy, and girl. And the Spirit of God argues the case to sway the heart and mind of the person who's hearing it. 
to bring them to that place where either they choose to accept or reject the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. It's a very spiritual thing that's going on when you share the gospel. It is not all up to you. Because it's a miracle when somebody trusts Christ. It is a miracle when somebody gets saved. It's just as much a miracle as when God created the stars as when a soul is born again and receives eternal life. And that's not a weight that you and I can bear on ourselves. We just do our part, and we let the Spirit of God do his part. By the way, God is a whole lot better at doing his job than we are at doing his job. And so we don't have to to try and make it happen. God will work it. So let's trust the Lord, and even if we have concerns about whether this is the right person, trust that the Lord is working and witness anyway. Thirdly, to grow your impact, grow your character. To grow your impact, grow your character. Barnabas' character was godly and faithful. He was led by the Spirit. And because of it, many people came to know Christ. Time and time again, we read in the book of Acts how great a person Barnabas is. But we don't read about his powerful preaching. We don't read about his letters that he wrote. It was just him being what he ought to be, and God used him. We do hear a lot about his character as opposed to his speaking skills or preaching. And so the closer that you and I get to God, the more we'll end up like God. And the greater impact, the greater influence we'll have on people around us. If you wonder how you can, ex- how you can extend your influence, your impact, into the lives of your loved ones, whether that's kids or grandkids or brothers and sisters or parents, whether that's neighbors, whether that's co-workers, It's about having that godly character. And godly character will support the things that we say and the things that we do because without that character, we have very little ability to change people's lives. I have a good friend. Uh, We're still friends to this day, though we don't live in the same state anymore. He was a student um, at Crown College for a little while, even though we were the same age. I was an instructor at the time that he was a student. He got saved later in life, and he was going to Bible college, and God changed his direction, and he ended up going to an aviation mechanics school. And he was interested in maybe using that for missions and things like that, and so he went to a, and he was in a a shop with a whole bunch of unsaved guys working in a mechanic-type environment, and the people around him were, were rough, and he started to act just like them. When they go out on smoke breaks, he'd go out on smoke breaks with them, and they would talk about things they ought not be talking about and joking about things they ought not be joking about, and they'd want to go out, and he'd start going out with them, and they'd want to drink, and he'd drink some and that. And he came to me, he said, I have totally lost my testimony with these guys. I have totally, if I were to tell them that I was a Christian and that they needed to be saved, there's no way that they'd listen to me because I have completely blown it. I have completely blown it. And that stuck with me, and, and God has worked in his life, and he's, he's uh, redeveloped his, his character, and I believe his testimony, and I praise the Lord for it. But if you and I want to be better witnesses or better teachers of the things of God, a uh, better ministry leader, um, or even just a better husband, wife, mother, father, grandmother, grandfather, whatever it is that God has put in your path, better student, better employee, All of these things, uh, it's about growing closer to the Lord. It's about growing closer. It's spending time with God and yielding to him. I know I've told this many times before, but I tried to quit swearing after I was saved, and it was really hard. I had an absolutely filthy mouth. My friends and I thought the more blasphemous and the more terrible thing you could say, the funnier it was before I became a believer. And then I got saved, and all those bad habits were still there. And things, I, I would try and be really good in church, but then outside of church, I was just still talking as though I was lost. And one day God convicted me of that, and I thought, I need to stop this. I need to start talking like a Christian. And, and so I came up with all sorts of weird ways to try and make myself quit swearing, right? Um, I, I tried to, to gamify it. I tried to, you know, like a swear jar on my own. I put a rubber band on my wrist like they tell you when you're trying to quit smoking. And every time you have an impulse, you're supposed to pull that rubber band and snap it on your wrist and the pain association. You know, I tried to do all of this stuff, and none of it worked. None of it worked. You know what happened? It was very slow, but it was inevitable. The larger Christ got in my life, the more he withered and crowded out the things that did not belong there. The bigger he got, the less room there was for all that other stuff, and he just slowly started pushing it out. He slowly started cleaning it out. 
and I started slipping up with my language less and less. And I started thinking about those things less and less. And I started joking about those things less and less. You say, what, what was the one thing that you did? I, I couldn't just say it was one thing. But I was reading God's word. I was praying. I was faithfully attending church. I was trying to come ready to hear from the messages. I was in Sunday school. I wanted to hear what the Bible was teaching me. Right? I was in those adult Bible teaching Sunday schools. I, I was trying to listen to Christian music. And, and all of these things just slowly, little by little, I was hanging out with Christian friends and learning that you can have a good time without being vile and without drinking and without partying. That there's, there's more joy, in fact, living God's way than there is in the world's way. And God just crowded out those things for me. And as I changed, other people started to notice, and my impact started to change on other folks. So you and I, if we want to grow our impact on others, we need to grow our character as well. A couple of questions before we pray and have our, our um, prayer sheet time. How can we deal with criticism in a godly way? I mentioned about not responding, but there's probably more to it than that. How can we deal with criticism in a godly way? than that, right? So looking to see if there's something in it, that's, that's a selfless way to deal with that instead of a fleshly way. How else can we deal with criticism? Remember that it didn't happen in a vacuum, and you may just be the target of opportunity on somebody's bad day. Correct. Anybody else? How do we handle criticism in a godly way? One of the oh yeah, Jim. One thing that helps me is to remember that Jesus Christ was the sinless Son of God who only went about doing good, and he only did those things to please the Father, and they still criticized him. The only way to not be criticized is to do nothing, to believe nothing, and to say nothing. And even then, someone would probably find fault with you. So it's, it's, something, it's something that 
we would probably have to deal with and know that it's not some unusual thing that's wrong with you, that it, it is part of walking uh, in a godly way. How did God prepare you to receive the gospel? Is there anybody who would be willing to share a little bit of their story? What did God do in your life to make you ready to hear? Rob? So God used your son. He used your son and the, the responsibility of being a father to make you open to the gospel. Yeah. Anybody else had God do something in their life? Maybe it was in a series of things. Yeah, Katie? Um, I had some real strange stuff. Over eight years of my life, I got saved. For eight years. And did something change? Did God do something to make you more receptive to it? Or was it just uh, slowly over time? So he used uh, the impact of somebody else's Christian living. Yeah. Anybody else? How did God prepare? Jim? And is, is there anything that you can think of of significance that it was these members of the Antioch church, this multicultural church, that they were first labeled Christian, that that's where that title came from? Anything of interest there? Yeah, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't just a purely Jewish congregation of believers, it was this mixture that God had put together. And seeing that this mixture of Jewish people and Gentiles together at the same time, all worshiping the same God, fellowshipping together, eating together, observing the Lord's Supper together, all of those things, that is where the moniker, where that name Christian first came from. I think that that's a powerful thing. Jim? The laying aside of prejudice. Very touching. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we rejoice in what you did in changing the lives of these people that we've read about and Barnabas' heart being so wide open in godly living so that not only he would be willing to accept and rejoice with these folks that were different than himself, but that he would have such an impact on them, even though they had different backgrounds. Lord, I thank you for how you teach us and we can rely on you that if we're on your side, no matter who says what about us, that we can be right and have our heads on our pillows and sleep well. Lord. Help us to always seek to be on your side. In Jesus' name.